Good morning, 18th of July, 2024, and let's look at some things that have come to light in the aftermath of the RNC nomination. This podcast is rated for a mature audience only. If you are under 18 years old, this content is not for you. Thank you for visiting us. There's plenty of other content on YouTube for you to watch. Have a great day. All content not created by the blue-haired bingo babe, that's me, belongs to its original creator. It is used to substantiate, augment, or exemplify this author's content. It is used under Title 17, Section 107 of U.S. Code, governing fair use for news, education, and critique. Trump is a modern-day Cyrus, so said evangelical thinker Lance Wallenau in 2016, referring to the Persian king Cyrus II, also known as Cambyses II, who was the king that let the Jews go free after he had conquered Babylon. That thought took hold with the evangelical sector of Christianity, and at the time, it bothered me. I've been listening to a wide range of opinions since this happened, and I am going to start with Bill O'Reilly. You can't do politics in the middle of an attempted assassination of a prior president of the United States. You can't. So that's all stopped. But Biden is not out of jeopardy. The most powerful people inside the Democratic Party want him out. And something else will happen. I'll get into that later. So, but for the time being, maybe a week or two, Biden gets a breather. He was real close to getting booted. And if you read the column, I I tell you exactly how that was going to come down. That column is posted tomorrow morning. Both candidates have an obligation now that they didn't have Friday. They have a new obligation. Both men have to admit they've made mistakes, rhetorical mistakes, because they both have. Now, neither Biden nor Trump has ever admitted a mistake, as far as we can find, ever. That's just a fact. Neither man admits mistakes. Okay? Now they should. If Donald Trump gets up there Thursday and says, look, I know I've been uh, gone overboard sometimes, and I'm going to really try not to do that anymore, he wins. Because Biden's not going to do that. If Trump does it, he wins. That's how strong that would be, that message to the American people. So both have an obligation now to say, all right, we're the leaders. And we're going to pull back from these personal attacks. We're going to do that. I hope they both do. I really, you know, it's fine for Biden to call Trump and for them to this. And and, and we can't have this in America. And, you know, lead. That's what I'm asking. Lead. You both have gone overboard in the past. Everybody knows that. If you're new here, thank you for joining me. I very much appreciate it. And if you don't know anything about me or my channel, this channel is Social Commentary, Missing Persons, and Interesting True Crime Cases. Right now, we are looking at the true crime case of the attempted assassination of former president, now Republican National Committee nominee for our next president, Donald Trump. I do not endorse channel. No clips that I am playing here are meant to endorse the channel, the channel holder, or their overall ideology and so forth. What I do clip and what I do feature is things that people have said that I agree with or that I think makes sense on a rational, logical, common sense basis. And I have questioned the extraordinary timing of what Donald Trump said just before he was hit in the ear. It unnerves me a little bit. But again, looking at this from all the facts we can find. So we're going to visit with Sean Parnell, a family man and father has had a relationship with Don Trump for a few years now, and he and his family were in the VIP section at the Butler, Pennsylvania rally. Sean Parnell appeared on Megyn Kelly's channel as part of a panel on July 16th, 2024. You mentioned spirituality and faith and religion, and and let me tell you, I've been on the stage with President Trump five times now, and from the moment that I walked into that rally, and people can call me crazy or whatever, but there was something different, there was something in the air. And and the reason why I know this is because on June 10, 2006 in Afghanistan, and I've not really told this story before, 
I was blown up and wounded pretty seriously, fractured my skull, got blown up by a rocket propelled grenade. And I was unconscious, but I felt something. I didn't know if I had already died or what, but I felt like something was beckoning me to get back in the fight. Something that like a spiritual presence that really felt like my grandfather, who I lost the day before I went to Afghanistan. When I was on that stage speaking, I felt that same damn thing. And people for 48 hours have been sending me images of the flag because I guess the wind had blown it and you know kind of got it tangled but sent me images of the flag from different angles, just convinced that there was something going on. It was surreal, call it an omen, say it was something spiritual, I don't know, looked like an angel. And they fixed the flag moments before Trump came out on that stage. And again, I just talked to the president 30 minutes prior before he walked out, but there was something in the air. I mean, again, people call me crazy or whatever, but there was something different about that day. And you're right. It, President Trump, he, he called for this. Oh, hey, you know, you got my favorite immigration graphic. You know, I go off script. I tell my people, like, I hate this teleprompter stuff. And they get the graphic up there. He looks once because he's got these screens behind him. It was right there with him. And he looks twice. And then six shots ring out. And I could hear the bullets, just the trajectory of the bullets. I could hear them going supersonic, cracking through the air right above my wife and I. And I saw President Trump grab his ear. A second later, the Secret Service was on him. And then I heard thump, thump of the counter sniper team. And then another couple of rounds, which was almost simultaneous. And those rounds hit people. These types of things are certainly unusual. We can think back to 9-11 when the only piece of standing metal found was an I-beam in the shape of a cross. And people have said that they saw faces in the smoke. Next, let's hear what Candace Owens had to say on her broadcast on July 14th, 2024. That is the perfect place to start, you guys, because that's where we are at right now in our society, that final instruction, not to believe your own eyes, not to believe your own ears, to wait until the authoritarians come out and tell you what is real. That's that's actually where we are, specifically in Western society. People go with that. I will guarantee you that a part of the population went to sleep last night and said, we don't know if it's an assassination attempt yet. We should wait to find out, we should wait until our government confirms, we should wait until the FBI, the most corrupt government organization that's plausibly ever existed, lets us know that it was in fact a failed assassination attempt. Well, keep attacking every person who's coming to you and saying something very evil is going on. People that have the courage to call what we are seeing, right? And I have been saying it, they are going to try to kill Donald Trump. Donald Trump better choose his vice president very carefully because if they suspect the person he has selected is someone that they can control, someone like a Nikki Haley, there is no reason that they would allow him to live. And some people don't want to deal with that. They don't want to deal with the reality of how evil our institutions are. Just a few minutes later, Candace Owens reminded us of another fact from the first term in the campaign of Don Trump. Maybe in the back of his mind, he never thought that it would get this bad. Maybe he didn't take people literally. Maybe he himself thought it was a conspiracy, the idea that they would shoot him in broad daylight. But maybe he did question whether or not they would ever get that desperate to do what they did to JFK. Maybe Trump thought, hey, that's the 60s. They could never do something like that today. They could never be so bold as to do something like that. Say people got smartphones, people could uh, put together the narrative faster than the mainstream media mockingbirds. And last night, he learned that he was wrong. You know, this is a good time to pause and and also to reflect on the fact that Donald Trump, when he got into office, he uh, accessed the JFK files because obviously it's been a mystery for decades. Who shot JFK? Oh, no, it's all locked down. Trust the Warren Commission report. And whatever he saw scared him. It scared him. He didn't want to talk about it anymore. He, he recognized a real danger that actually scared him when he opened those files. He didn't. He said, when I get in and become president, I'm going to tell you who shot JFK. And then he didn't tell us who shot JFK. No, he sure didn't, did he? And these two were never mentioned. Nobody has ever looked into Robert Kennedy Jr.'s assassination or Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King's with fresh eyes. And I find that frustrating on a good day. By mid-morning, on Friday morning, we were getting headlines like this. And Trump wasn't even there yet. Those are all photoshopped. Nevertheless, let's go inside and see what the convention hall looked like after the voting was done. 
I gotta hand it to you, the RNC, they found one of the best cover bands I've heard in years. And while I can't bring you any of the music because it's all copyrighted, I can give you this shot of the lead guitarist who looks astonishingly like a dear friend of mine if my friend would just cut off his 70s lion's mane of hair. But I digress. The younger people didn't seem to be too interested in the band, but women of a certain age and a few gentlemen as well did appreciate the tailor-made playlist. As you can see, Grandma still got it. When I say that the playlist was tailor-made, they opened with Grand Funk's American Band, went on to a very long song by Cheap Trick, which included a jam session, which almost never happens on the second song from the classic rock world. But nevertheless, they moved on through a roster of very familiar songs designed to distract from the tragic and reinsert an emotional hook in people of a certain age. And it worked because all but forgotten except for a moment of silence hours earlier, was Fire Chief of Buffalo Township, Corey Comparatore, whose daughter will never forget him. Now, I have to insert a preemptive apology to any of the speakers who did remember the Fire Chief from, Butler, or from Buffalo Township and his family in the interim before J.D. Vance made an appearance in the hall. Welcome the next President of the United States, Donald J. Trump. And just like that, we're back in the cafe with the dull roar of our friends and neighbors, the slamming of the dishwasher, and the banging of the cash register. And while the band played on and the speaker spoke, the headlines began to change again. And we found out that in the interim between being shot and appearing on the floor of the RNC for the opening night, Donald Trump was not humble, grateful, or anything like that. He was wheeling and dealing RFK, who I don't think took the bait. And then we began seeing headlines like this. And in a republic, the word coronation has no room for, or place in our political discourse. Call it damage control, call it massive enthusiasm. It's wholly legally inappropriate. And truth be told, the only one who gets any grace from me on these antics is Laura Trump. That's her dad. So she's forgiven. And that brings us back to our opening shot with Cyrus of Persia being the first comparison to Trump. And I'm just wondering because with all the pop and circumstance, it sure looks like it. 
who's going to be the first one to compare Trump to triumphant King David when he re-entered the city of Jerusalem, having put down his enemies for lack of a more politically correct term. And I'll just be honest, I did not want Biden elected a first time because I saw what it was the first time. Bluntly, it's elder abuse. He is not fit for service, period. But I didn't want Trump to serve a second term either because I was reasonably sure at whatever he age he is, 71 or something like that, he was not going to change. He's not going to show humility and gratitude to God for sparing his life. So far, he's not shown that. He has accepted the accolades and the uh, fatuous praise with a smile and a clap and a raised fist in defiance of what he should realize by now, that he is one lucky father and one lucky grandfather to be here to see his kids and grandkids. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with two candidates, in my opinion, who are not fit for service. One marginally more fit because he still has command of his faculties, although not his temperament. And one candidate that can't get on the ballot legally in time for November vote. He's got a handful of states, J uh, RFK does, that have allowed him on, but there's no way he's going to get enough states to give Trump a run for his money. And after Trump's wheeling and dealing uh, you know, over the weekend, we don't really have any choices. But I'll leave you with one tidbit from Megyn Kelly, because what's going on in Washington, despite all of their delegates having cast their votes for Donald Trump, is unthinkable. One of the things we all know about the Washington media is that they don't report everything they know, but often there are rumors that circulate among them that they cannot put in the newspaper because they don't want to burn their bosses, their Democrat sources. What we understand is that Chuck Schumer drove himself, or was driven, to Delaware to have a personal one-on-one -on -one meeting with Joe Biden to make his appeal that Biden should not be the nominee. They're trying to steal the nomination from this old man. <laughs> Arm wrestle it away. <laughs> and it apparently didn't go over well. It didn't. Josh has the details on the meeting. What, what a shock. Yeah, well, I mean, so, look, I, I think knowing Schumer, we I speculate what he does, but I'm sure that he had poll numbers and all kinds of things indicating it was a huge problem for the party down ballot, obviously. And this is the moment, right? Biden said, I'll resign if somebody shows me that I can't win. So he goes in with polls. So I think he took advantage of it and had this conversation, ultimately didn't get the answer that he wanted. When he came out of the meeting, he said, good meeting which to me immediately was a huge sign, right? If you're meeting with the nominee of your party 100 days before an election and you don't say, I fully support Joe Biden. And you know he's twisting in the wind. Yeah, I fully support him. Our conference supports him. We can't wait to vote for him in November. Something short of that indicates there's something else that happened. And then what we found out when we got to Milwaukee, it's the worst kept secret. Every single journalist, whether it's, you know, you name the publication, We've talked to him over the last few days. Every single person knows exactly what happened, but they asked Chuck Schumer, and it's a one-on-one -on -one meeting, and he denies it. Mm -hmm. So they're not reporting. Well, I mean, obviously, he, he's spoken, and so is Biden to others, and that's how these yeah. reporters get it. And, you know, they always report things that are not, you don't get from the direct source. So this is kind of sketchy to me. Like, there's a reason. They're well, not it's about a Democrat, Megan. Yeah. That's <laughs> but now the press has turned on him. Yeah, it's true. So they, they want this out, probably. And so the interesting thing is, as soon as we bring this up, I check my Twitter after we put it out there. And Schumer's press secretary starts following me. Yeah, he's not, not a huge oh. fan, not a known fan of country. I appreciate <laughs> him. I appreciate him. The scuttlebutt is that the only person that can get Joe Biden to step aside and retire is Jill Biden. So put that in your calculus. Get your slide rule out and your calculator on your phone. See if you can find a way out of this disaster better than I can because quite frankly the last couple of days watching what happened after the attempt on candidate former president Donald Trump's life making me a little weepy and a little scared for the fate of this country that's all I have for this show I will be bringing you a couple of tidbits from the RNC most of which I have not watched yet because being a one 
person show means that I spend a lot of time editing. And the more clips and the more shots and the more sound bites I have, the longer it takes. At any rate, thanks so much for joining me. Your likes, subscriptions, and especially your shares are always appreciated. Comments and questions, of course, can be left in the comment box below. God bless you, and I'll see you real soon.